So I wanted to apologize from the beginning about the quality of this video and if you're having any trouble hearing me specifically because for some reason my mic wasn't picking up sound as good as Cody's. And I tried out a new platform. Um, it was a bad time to try to try a new platform because this new platform didn't work out too well for this recording. And I, I had, you know, just to kind of clarify, um, I, I did feel like I wasn't supposed to work with a platform that had AI connections because I did, I do feel like AI <clears throat> is an avenue for demonic to come through a, a artificial intelligent body. I do feel like computers and phones are a networking system for a provide a body space for, um, the fallen to communicate through. And Cody and I did have an interruption in the middle of our recording where this other image would show up, like somebody else was in our meeting. And it was almost like you could feel this spiritual entity in, in this meeting, which was another confirmation to me how important it was to get this word out because the enemy really tried to disrupt this recording in many ways. Luckily, this platform that I used had a complete backup video that included everything but all of the tracks that we ran with all of the the input that i had to put into this video through the screen share and everything and then all of the times that it kicked cody and i out uh or, or kicked cody out um you know really the enemy tried to completely destroy this this recording and it was such a good conversation because we captured a lot of cody's initial reactions to learning these things about mormonism i did not want to have to redo it which we were willing to do but i just wanted to get on and apologize and, and say you know we would we would have redone the video but there was so much good raw material in this that i wanted to salvage it but i'm sorry if you have to struggle to hear my voice we've turned up the sound and editing as much as we could um, but Cody's voice is obviously going to be louder than mine as some parts. And then there are some parts that just completely dropped out and we lost parts of the conversation. So I've tried to cut in some videos to clarify some things there. So my apologies and please bear with us. But um, I can promise you that it's going to be well worth the struggle to get through. So thank you. All right. Welcome to Kadosh Life tonight. Um, I am super stoked to be here tonight. Um, I don't know that I've been so excited to talk to anybody in a while because the Lord has clearly been working on this message. So we hope that you'll stick around for the entirety of this conversation um, with this wonderful man, Cody uh, Leatherberry. Is that how you say it? Leatherberry? Yes. And you're perfect. <laughs> um, AKA Bloodbot. And we're going to hear an amazing witness of a near-death experience that he had where he was taken into hell and witnessed um, Joseph Smith in hell. So stick around. All right, Cody, welcome. <laughs> so excited to finally be chatting with you. Um, for me, it's been yeah. coming. I've been trying to get in touch with you, and uh, we had the hands of the good and the hands of the bad all involved in all of that, but God wins. So here we yeah, are. Yeah, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> um, when I heard your story on Randy K., um, I was super surprised when I heard you mention that when you were in hell, all of a sudden I heard you say Joseph Smith and me having grown up Mormon, um, that really caught my attention. I was like, wait a minute, what did I just hear him say who he saw in hell? And I was actually myself going through a big um, personal experience of discovery after having left the Mormon church, trying to really ratify in my mind. So I really didn't mean to use the word ratify here. Um, what I was meaning to say was I wanted to come to peace with, to clarify, to sort out, to comprehend, to decipher, to resolve and reconcile in my mind what 
Joseph Smith's role in, in Mormonism was not as far as two Mormons or what the Mormon concept is, but in the eyes and mind of God and, and the kingdom coming from uh, um, revelation through Holy Spirit to be able to get the truth of what was behind his intentions. And because there's so much false history in Mormonism and everything's been changed so much without like hearing it straight from heavenly sources, it's going to be really hard to clarify and, and receive clarity on what his role truly was because there's been so much deception along the way. Um, what Joseph Smith's r true role was, who he was, because he's so idolized within the Mormon church that I really wanted to... I, ha I had been trying more and more, even though I'd been out of the church for, for four years, to um, understand what his role was and, and who he really was. Because I myself have read the Book of Mormon at least, I don't know, a lot of times. And oh, probably, wow. probably three times just the year that I left the Mormon church, I read it again. And there is truth in the Book of Mormon. I can say that, that there is truth in the Book of Mormon. And so a lot of people who leave the church or in the church have a really hard time after leaving the church trying to understand, like, what, how, how did he have all this truth? And how are there, you know, millions, like, what is it now, 16-something million members in this church and people coming in and being baptized every year if this is all just a big scam, you know? And so I want oh, wow. to your experience with you tonight um, about your NDE, near-death experience, when you died and you saw three groups of people in hell, the third one that we're going to focus mostly on being Joseph Smith, and um, really go into detail. I want to take this in a different turn. So um, Cody has been on two other interviews, and I'll link those below in the description box. And I recommend you go back and take a good look at those to get the fullness of his whole experience, because we'll just touch on a little bit of that. But we're going to really focus on the third group that you saw there being... Um, the group where you saw and interacted with Joseph Smith on a very personal level. And yeah. then what I want to do differently with you today in our conversation is so, so I'm a dream interpret interpreter. So really what that means is I read symbolism. The Holy spirit shows me and gives me understanding of the symbolism behind um, certain things. And so even though this was a real experience and you really went to hell it, it's going to be a really cool thing for us to delve into also because, you know, people are going to learn a lot about what it looks like to interpret a dream because we're going to basically do this interpretation of your experience the same way I would interpret a dream or the living word through life experiences. Um, I, think, I think that's really appropriate because when, even though, it, you know, where I put my five bucks is that I was physically there, you know what I mean? Um, but it's like... Um, when I saw him, I went into his, I'll call it a trance. So he's, he's, you know I mean? He's, he's, he's in another place. You know, I'm looking at him where he's really at. And then we go where he is, thinks he's at basically. I don't know. So we were in a dream land. We went into something that wasn't real. You know what I mean? At, at some point. So it yeah. looked pretty real. But. And that's how I think the other dimensions <laughs> of heaven and hell work is, is through teaching us understanding through, um, you know, symbolism and experiences and um, uh, places and things that are tangible. And so you actually saw and felt those things, but it was almost like you were being taken into his mind and shown his, his thoughts. And so, so the visuals of all the different things that you saw and even the words that you used to describe them are really important because Holy Spirit doesn't play around when it comes to sharing testimony. Like each thing that you've said, like rings a bell with me and grabs at me and goes, Oh, that's what that is. And that's what underneath that, that's the meaning that lies underneath that. So there's a lot more to even the other testimonies that you've shared than probably you're even going to realize. And I think it's really awesome too, that you were chosen to, have this experience because the thing that I want everybody to understand about Cody is he's incredibly humble and very naive only when it comes to the Mormon church. <laughs> um, you know, almost nothing about the inner workings of the Mormon church. You didn't know nothing about 
Joseph Smith. Yeah. This experience. Really, really, su really surprised when I learned who I saw because it had no connection with me whatsoever. I'd, I never had any idea to, to take down the Mormon church or to come against Mormons or nothing. It's just a, it's a non-player in my life. I don't know Mormons. I didn't grow up around Mormons. I didn't even rec you know what I mean? Like not until my father-in-law, you know, pointed out who I saw. I didn't even know who I saw, you know what I mean? And then I was disappointed when I realized who it was just cause I'm a Christian, you know what I mean? And it's like, there's in America, the things I've heard of is like Gandhi or I've heard of like Buddha or I've heard of like, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, I don't know that Muslim dude or whatever. And it, it, but anyway, make a long story short, the Joseph, Joseph Smith would be like the least on the, as far as me knowing anything about or caring about or being interested in about, he's like at the bottom. And so it, I, it didn't make no sense to me at all why I saw him, or, you know, until I moved to Idaho. And then everybody I talked to about Jesus, you know, I, I find out, oh, they're Mormon. Oh, okay. But yeah. I didn't, I, when you said, what'd you say, 16 million uh, church members? Oh, yeah. That's no, okay. So I don't think you'd say anything close to that either. So well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn more than you learn on this uh, interview. Let's go. <laughs> Well, it's, exci it's exciting, and we'll go a little more into all of that. But before we go too far into your experience and Joseph and all of that, um, you're, you are blood-bought, a.k.a. blood-bought, and that's your rapper, Christian, you're a Christian rapper. And how long have you been doing that? How did you get into that? I could have come up with a better name than blood-bought, maybe. But yeah, it's too great. Late, too, it's late, too, late, too late now. <laughs> you didn't get it like, anyway. That's God's will. <laughs> oh so like maybe since i was 12 when i was 12 years old i was driving from portland up to seattle i was in the back of my dad's uh ford ranger and i started getting these words well i was praying anyways you know what i mean i was like 12 years old and i'm like god when are you gonna send me my wife you know so we were talking and uh he, he gave he gave me my first poem and I, you know it wasn't nothing but a poem but as time went by i put it in music you know what I mean? And uh, I, I can't really sing anyway, so that's all you're going to get. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm also a poet, and so I really have a lot of respect and love for putting words and feelings and emotions behind, especially when it comes to spirituality and Jesus and God and incorporating pain and heaven and hell and all of that into words. You know, it's really powerful. And so... Uh, yeah, 100%. I want to give you an opportunity to share some of your art, um, which then I, w so we're going to have less than an interview, but more of a conversation and a back and forth. Um, and so I'm going to have Cody share, and then I'm going to share a poem that I actually wrote this week that I was inspired by as I was going through all of this. And it was after I'd listened to one of your interviews, I loved what you said. You were talking about how, um, was it your grandma? I can't remember. Or your aunt who told you that, there's a room in heaven. Do you remember where um, songs come from? Oh, okay. I, I know what you're talking about. I've seen this when I was at my grandma's house as a kid. I think it was on TBN. Some lady said she went to heaven and she saw a room where, with songs and stuff. They were all over the walls. I don't know. I'm picturing clipboards hanging up, but to make a long story short. She says that an angel will come in, grab the song and then go down to earth where there was some little girl playing her piano. And he would give her the song and she would start writing. And, it, you know, what I mean, like, and I've, I've had that experience when I wrote a song called Internal Grind for a guy. Um, he, he just kind of wrote down what he wanted in the song. And I, I was frustrated. I was like, why did I promise to write this dude a song? Like, I, like that was stupid. You know, what I mean, and so I'm in his gym and I was pacing back and forth. And I ran into what I believe would be like an angel. So it's like a, I, physically I ran into something that I noticed physically you know what i mean and it had like the presence of the holy ghost you know peace and power and anyways i walked past i walked through it and i started hearing in my head internal grind on my soul i threw my life down a hole or whatever you know what i mean and then i just started writing and then i i went to the bottom of the page and i, I needed more paper so quick i would i would just so i know i know that song is really good and it's because i didn't really write it 
You know what I mean? So I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. and I, I totally relate because you also mentioned how, like, when you sit down and try to write something on your own, it's crap. Like, it just doesn't. Oh, yeah. You know, when it, when you get an idea and you have a feeling, you're like, oh, I want to write a poem about that. And then you go sit down and, like, Holy Spirit doesn't didn't give it to you yet or, or it's just your idea and you're not really supposed to write about that. Like, you're just fumbling over. But, like, when, oh, I, yeah. when I write a poem and it's given it to me, um, I can almost sit and I usually do them on my phone, but I, I can almost not make a single mistake, not have to cross out a single word. And it's just given, you know, um, yeah. he's bringing me more into the process now where he'll let, like be like, well, how do you feel about that? Or what's your thought on that? And he's teaching me how to go look up scriptures and expand my vocabulary because my poetry is more like um, it, it's I don't like complicated poetry that has a lot of really big you gotta think. complicated words in it where you're like what the hell does that mean i know it means yeah, no. the definition of that word you know like <laughs> my stuff is simple enough that a child could understand and that's how i write because uh my books are called prophetic poetic that i haven't published yet they're not out but that's the name of the books that i have written in my computer that are stored away the prophetic poetic and because because it's prophetic, I can't claim them. They're just given to me. And they just, when, when they come, I've even written a poem about how I write a poem, about the process of how it's given <laughs> to me. So, yeah, I can tell you oh, that's exciting. And I love to hear your stories about all of that. So, so yeah, I'd love to hear. Okay, so, before you do this one, I want you to share how. You don't want to do it at the end of the video? You want to do it in the beginning? It, let's do it the first. I want, yeah, let's get into it now and then we'll do it. Is that okay? Yeah. Wait, okay. Just because, well, I want you to share because this song was given to you before you went to hell, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wrote this song about being in hell and my experience of not getting out and just kind of facing, facing the music, you know. And um, when I showed it to my parents, I showed it to my aunt or whatever. Everybody was like, why would you write a song like that? And so I was like, I was kind of in agreement with them. I was like, I don't know. Yeah, it is kind of messed up. I don't know why I wrote this. You know what I mean? And it was just, you know, kind of like, whatever. I'll just write a different song and forget about it. But, um, but my, yeah, but uh, later, it wasn't, it wasn't long later. Uh, I ended up, I ended up in hell myself for real. And uh, that was no good. Well, you know, and what did so. you, what did your aunt say? Didn't your aunt stop you? Uh, one time when I was showing my aunt, I was in Hood River, Oregon, and I was playing on the piano a simple beat, you know, and I started rapping, you know, uh, my Jesus Christ, I look up to the sky through these blurry eyes, ain't no need to cry, but I'm in hell tonight or whatever. I start getting into it, and all of a sudden, like, I'm not even halfway done with the song, and my aunt, she just, like, shrieks out, tells me to shut it down. So I shut it down. I was like, what's up? And she's like, as you were speaking that, she heard like a demonic spirit tell her that that is where I'm going to end up. And so it freaked her out. I stopped the song. I never, I never wanted to do the song again. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like, all right, nobody likes the song. I don't know why I wrote the song. I don't even think I like the song. I was like, <laughs> but, but, the, but then I end up going to hell for real. And I'm like, well, if you want me to do a song, I'll do the hell one. You know what I mean? So it's kind of fits. So an interesting note about this part is that there's this young woman that I mentioned in another clip is that um, Cody was approached by this young woman, woman in a public place who had a prophetic message given to her from the Holy Spirit and she came and approached him. And one thing that she told Cody that was fascinating to me is that not only was he famous in heaven, but that he was famous in hell. And so this, um, you know, song that he got about that he was going to end up in hell was fascinating because it's prophetic that he did go to hell. And then he does go to hell and he sees this prophecy and this um, revelation about Joseph Smith and the Mormon church. And then he therefore is famous in hell because of the word that he spread about the truth of Joseph Smith's presence there. So um, I just wanted to add that note in that I think that's really beautiful that this young lady was challenged by Holy Spirit to come and share that with him and that, you know, we can count on the fact that based on this story, Cody's definitely famous in heaven and in hell. Well, yeah, it's, it's good because it'll, it'll, it's a prophecy of your experience is really what it is. And a lot of the art that we 
you know, mess, mess with and get and download. And even when we're practicing before Holy Spirit really comes in and like buys out our gift fully and wholly consecrates it to the Lord, you know, sometimes we end up with these pieces that point to something and, and it actually points to your experience. So I think it's really cool that you should. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. want to go ahead? You want to do it? Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Oh, so man. I'm not I'm not like a guitar player for real. So you know what I mean I'm just gonna I have some music to kind of try to rap to or whatever. But um, my Jesus Christ, look to the sky through these blue eyes. Ain't no need to cry, but I'm in hell tonight as the shadows arise. There ain't no taking back the choices I made in my life. I'm all shook though, regret and not to follow the line on death row with no hope. Avoid in this night, a poisonous fire. And let it burn on my spine. No mercy and curse to me was the darkest of vibes. And Lord, forgive me, cause I see I took it too far. Jesus, please tell God I'm changing my heart and let me out. I cannot stand this horrible place. Man, this fire we place, I'm running the chase. And what about all my homies? I don't know what I know. Hey, Father, please tell my brothers not to go where I go. It's no use, cause like me. Yeah. Ain't to know it all, living a dream but to see. Yeah. Soon as it dissolves, yeah, I heard that your eyes the winners to your soul. You can look into my eyes, all to see is a ghost. I'm long dead and well fed yeah. on nothing but dry bones. I go home, but never had a place to call my own. I'm all alone out here. Can no one understand the visual lies? The very tears I cry, dry before they touch my eyes. You walk and hear the screaming, it keeps me up at night. Like I don't think I could be sleeping, even if I tried. You all could feel the presence, man, death is in the air. It's so quiet that it's almost like nothing's there. What can I do? I see my fate in this dark place. I face to face with these demons of a dark race. What do I do? I see some movement deep within the shadow. And something's watching me. My bones are deep and get to rattle. The coldest heat I ever felt before. I'm not alone out here to fall and share with an open door. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Made it happen. Okay. Hell Next. yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, it was a little, cre a little creepy, actually. Now I hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> Very prophetic. Very prophetic. I mean, there was several things that stood out, and almost like if I had the words sitting down, I'd have. I'd be in trouble because I'd have a whole other <laughs> level of things to break out and the symbolism and prophecy of everything that related to what we're about to talk about. So that's awesome. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. All right. I'm going to share now my poem that I wrote. Yeah, and let's go. Yeah, so, so what happened is we were talking about, you know, this room that in heaven where these... Uh, gifts song and poem or poetry are given and to me poetry and songs the same except for just lack of mine has a beat and not music behind it and, and the, a song all the difference really is is it comes with more of a tune um yeah. and um so i was thinking about how much i do love that space and how much i would i love going there and you were talking about how you love writing mm -hmm. um, more than even sharing it why don't you share why you love that part uh, when I was a little kid and I'd be, you know, 12, 13 or whatever, I'd be writing these songs. The whole, so I go to write a song and I'm just playing a beat and I'll ask, I'll ask the Lord. I'm like, you know, I want to write a song for you. I want it to glorify you. I basically want you to tell me what to write. You know what I mean? Um, I would just invite him in that, in that space. And when I was a youngster, dude, I had, I had real quick access to the Holy ghost. You know what I mean? Like when you're first dating somebody, there's all that, you know, like everybody's on their best behavior. They're blessing each other, you know, down a long road relationship after marriage or whatever. You guys are kind of more like yourselves, no more flirting as much and stuff. You know how it kind of just goes downhill a little bit. And uh, when I, anyways, I, I would sit there and I'd ask him to give me a song, you know what I mean? And I would feel, I would start hearing. And it's my voice in my head, just the same as if I was thinking of the song myself, only it starts without my permission. So that's how I know that it's like, it, it's definitely like I'm getting something, you know what I mean? It's not me, you know, because it's just like all of a sudden I'm getting it so I can hear it. And then I would feel the Holy Ghost. I would get like my skin would light up, goosebumps or whatever. Depends on how strong he's coming in, you know, but he's coming in hard. 
and then he would give me the song and then it would be sad i'd be sad when when i feel like it was over you know what i mean because it would lift i could tell that it would lift and then it was like the song's done and you know what i mean but that was my favorite part it's just him when he shows up when i'm in the presence of the lord that's the that's the one you know what i mean i would take that over being on a stage at woodstock any dang day like i don't even like to perform i don't li i don't like the limelight i don't like and I got. I know a lot of rappers, and they eat it up. They like being up there, and they like people clapping for them. And I just don't give a crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just. Yeah. Uh, so I'm. I'm a, I, I think I'm a, Yeah. So let's I hear your poem. That. Okay. Yeah. So I I was relishing in that same place, and um, that I go and and just that secret space, and and I was just thinking about everything I'd been you know pouring over with the symbolism of your experience and so this kind of i i don't even know it just popped in and came out and so this is what i got so Hallelujah. it's called the open door born a sinner but bought by blood from my day of birth and since the flood he called my name and chose me still anointed called to do his will but as a man of nature's sin, my fallen flesh, my will caves in. But sins of heart I hate the most, never deny the Holy Ghost. But hate the world to be herein, this place I toil, my flavored sin. Touch you not, sorry, touch not you called. Let me do that better. Touch not you called and do no harm, anointed still, weapons disarmed. As each attack my enemy has waged against where weakness be, but oil poured upon my head, one day your footsteps shall I tread and consecrate my life of sin, bestowed by grace on fallen men. Though we deserve it not, my king, my weary walk, renew each sting that burns the soul of dirtied hands, my boast in weakness for greater plans. He hath for me through <laughs> prayer. For weak they be, as I declare. Forgive my sins, I beg you, Lord. I still fall short, flesh came by word. To rescue me, yet I have done no work to save by grace is one for all my sins that lead to death were swallowed up your promise kept but on my heart your eye would look and write my name in heaven's book and i not boast for many called but chosen i now grasp the rod for with your staff its crooked wood neck you reached into hell's gates to pluck this wretch from prison's open door where i walked in but sin no more at least attempt to do your will repenting daily yet sinner still for never can i do enough but cry lord lord please open up the gates of hell and pluck me out these open doors rebuke my doubt and mediate my every deed and speak no guile you decreed for knit i was before my birth in mother's womb you gave me worth and purchased me i am blood-bought considered me no thing of naught but of my worth, the price you paid, with death and pain and sorrow laid, there at the cross you put it down, for me, a wretch, my sinner's crown, was put upon your head by thorn, and took upon my object's scorn, for my wage of sin was death, expensive wrongs, free, paid with breath. This gift of life, eternal blessed. Thank God my soul one day shall rest. For hopelessness, eternal gloom, 
I should have had inside this room where you once left an open door to walk me out this prison's floor, indebted now a servant's price. My soul is yours, eternal life. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I related to that, man. I related to that a lot, honestly. I'm well, not a big it was, it, was, it was all the imagery that had been playing out of your story, so you should. <laughs> I totally related to that. Okay. Or you did it on purpose. All right. <laughs> well, I was, kind of, I was kind of doing it through my own. It was crazy because I was doing it through my own experience too. And when you generalize our experiences and the patterns, like they're so similar. And so then when I, when I got done and then I got to like the, when blood bot, bot came and it was like, then I read it again. It was like, Oh, it's the same. Like <laughs> same experience, different, um, details you know yeah What's the details you know, we, we all got the same problem adam had and that's trying to be your own god trying to like overrule god and do your own thing you know step it, trying to step into his place and that's where we all get it wrong so it makes sense that it's familiar you know speaking of joseph and those familiar spirits let's get to it <laughs> <laughs> right um oh, so we're going to take this kind of slow. We're going to go through, and I actually have a, um, like a screen share that I want to do. And I have some pictures that I want to um, use to just kind of ignite some of the imagery that I saw as you were um, um, sharing your testimony on the one that I watched. Uh, yeah. It's going to take a minute to pop up. But, and then as we get through each of these pieces and points of your experience, I'll have you expound on them. And then I'll share what I feel, um, how it points to Mormonism, the pieces of the puzzle that, you, that you're missing. Because, you know, what's really interesting is before, you know, we started this recording, you and I were talking and you were sharing with me how, well, sh why don't you tell me what it was that you had shared with me about this prayer that you said last night at work? Oh, I was just like, uh, you know, the last couple of days, and this happens every time before I do an interview or I go tell, or I tell somebody about my health testimony, I can pick up on like, I don't want to say demonic attack, dude, because Jesus has me covered, but whatever, dude, just feeling like, uh, not oppression, maybe oppression, I don't know, a weight, carrying something, not good, I don't know, but, so anyways, like last night, I came in here in this warehouse, dude, and I got on my face, you know what I mean, and, um, uh, you know, he enters, enters gates with Thanksgiving and I was just thanking him or whatever. But then I ended up asking him, hey, you know, basically, I don't understand why the heck you showed me Joseph Smith of all people. You know what I mean? And I was like, you know, could you please like explain to me something about that? I don't know, you know, about why I went to hell, why I saw that dude, what you want me to do with it? You know what I mean? Because because to me, you know, what I mean, it's like it's, it's about as it's like, oh, I went to hell. I saw the. You know, I saw the dude off the subway commercial, you know what I mean? You know, it's like a nothing burger. Like, who cares that you saw him, right? You know, and that's, and if you're outside of the Mormon church, that's what everybody, as far as I know, that's what, it's just like a big joke. So it's not, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah. To, 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 to a non-Mormon, to a, to a non you'd rather see, uh, you'd rather see <laughs> freaking Columbus. I don't know. <laughs> and just somebody that you really are familiar with, you know? Actually, so I'm going to so, stop sharing screen for a second because I'm going to give you a few minutes to give us the intro leading up to you had a near death, you you had a drug overdose, you saw three groups in hell. So just give me the brief of all of that before we get to the Joseph Smith experience. All right. I don't know the I don't know the exact year, about 2010 ish or something, right? So um, I was so 18 uh, years ago. You were about 24 or something. About, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I'm 39 now. I'll be 40 in October. So, uh, I basically, I'm, I'm on dope, you know, I'm, I'm married to a girl and the marriage isn't very happy. You know what I mean? Like it, it just, we married real quick and I was in Fountain, Colorado, you know what I mean? And, uh, just really going through it. Um, uh, I start, anyways, I was, hooked to, I was hooked on heroin and if I couldn't get heroin, I had methadone or suboxone, you know what I mean? Or Opanas or Oxys or what I would, I'd have something, you know what I mean? And so on this day, like this last, this couple of days, I was just taking uh, methadone and, uh, 
You know what I mean? Because for some reason it was all dry or whatever. So it's like I was, th- I, I'd wake up and I'd take 15 methadone 10. I would like, I'd crush up five of them and snort them, you know, but I would eat 10 of the 10s, right? So I'd take 15 of them in the morning and then I would be sick by, by 12 hours later. So I, basically twice a day at some point I'm doing another 15, right? you know what I mean? And it wouldn't do nothing to me. I wouldn't feel it. Hey, you know I want to I mean? say something real quick about your drug addiction, just real quick, because I've always wondered about heroin because I, I, that's one thing I, I never understood heroin. And I actually, the last guy that I ever, before I just went straight into the Lord and was like, I'm done with men, you know, I'm done. The last guy I considered being in a relationship with, I had different, I mean, eighth grade, after college, after I got divorced, and then again, right before I swore off of men forever. And he was the last one that I was, you know, involved with and a month after i moved back to california after leaving my kids he really helped me through when i was just like kind of in hiding and i was like god if there's one good left if there's one good left just show me who they are a friend anybody because i was so alone you know and i ended up connecting with him and um because everybody in my whole life had been um handlers and had been sent in like I, I was in an arranged marriage and I didn't know it like every guy I was nearly ever with was like given permission to it was just disgusting how it all worked and so so this was different because I what? thought that maybe all of these experiences that I'd had with him before were set up so I actually challenged him on that when we were reconnecting and he said to me you know because I was like oh yeah all these satanists and he's he's like what are you calling me a satanist he's like I serve one God and it's through Jesus Christ and he claimed him so boldly you know I was like whoa if he wouldn't have said that I probably would have never talked to him again so that got us reconnected and I took him up to do a baptism at the hot springs and you know we had a short little uh you know romance for a really short time before I moved back to California and um, went to try to get custody of my kids back and he was he was just you know really sweet to me but he he was clearly um uh he traumatized he there was something going on inside of him like he would have yeah. and stuff and I, I didn't know what it was and i he was huge too and i knew he was on steroids and so when i saw marks on his arm i just thought it was from steroids i had no idea he was doing heroin you know i would have never guessed and so he died of an overdose and i believe it was on it, it was one of those, I can't remember if it was Suboxone or Methadone or one of those things. He overdosed with that, with a needle, you know, a month after the last time that I saw him. And he came and helped me move all of my stuff out of um, my sister's house, where, well, my house where I was living that I left and took off from with my family. I had all this, he came and helped me carry all this heavy stuff out. So he passed away. So I just wanted to quickly pay a tribute because I never met really heroin addicts. My nephew supposedly died of a heroin addiction but there was no heroin in his system when we found out um his autopsy a little while later and i believe that he was sacrificed by my family in one of their rituals because when i started asking questions that was when they locked me up in the psych ward so what i want to say about drugs and heroin is what the heck? i have known <laughs> that have had experiences with it are some of the most wonderful god-fearing people that i know but they don't know how to be in this world and so i just want to put that out there while you're talking about this drug addiction that i think that a lot of heroin addicts are some of the most um god-fearing people and they don't know how to function and this world makes no sense to them and they ha- and false religion and and lack of you know being able to know how to access God and how to heal ourselves with, you know, Jesus Christ and access that power. I just, I find a lot of those people that I met at his funeral who were all ex drug addicts were some of the most wonderful people I'd ever met, you know? Um, so anyway, I, I, we have a huge misconception about drugs and drug addicts in this world. And there's some of God's greatest people who are messed up on drugs. I, I know that. And I've witnessed that. Well, I mean, I don't really under, I don't really relate to a kleptomaniac and somebody who goes into Walmart and they got to risk going to jail and have to steal something for 20 bucks. I, I don't relate to that. You know, I don't have no temptation to take things. I just, I just, you know, it is what it, I don't know. It's just not my thing. I, I don't relate to people who are attracted to anything but, you know, basically my wife, you know, a human woman, you know, like if you're attracted to anything but a human woman, I got nothing for you. You know what I mean? So, but when it comes to drugs, you know, that's a, that's, that's something I, you know, well versed in or whatever, just because I didn't have, you know, as a kid, I didn't have much, uh, I didn't have supervision or curfews or whatever. You know what I mean? Like everybody else had, 
and we weren't even in car seats, so it's like, you know, my parents the weren't. Killers. Yeah, my parents the weren't that clue. The they're, yeah, they're, killers are the ones that seek drugs. People who feel things really deeply end up. They don't know how to feel, and that, and then they end up doing drugs because it makes you feel something, and and nothing in this world feels that good, you know. And so I, it's, it's, I find these really passionate, deep feelers are a lot of times end up on drugs. Huh. Never thought about it, but yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. So sorry, I interrupted. So you, so you were, you had taken all these. Um, what was it? So take, take, or what were you? I was taking fifteen methadone tans in the morning and at night or in the middle of the night or something, right? So I'm doing this for a couple of days. And what happens is one morning I wake up and like, I had this, I had this argument with my wife and she go, she went to work or whatever. And I was unemployed at the time. So I go figure, right? So anyways, um, I went to the bathroom and I took the 15 methadone tens, just like I always did. And to me, it wasn't nothing. I'm telling you, I would not get high. You do not hallucinate off methadone. You know what I mean? At least where Why I was at. Too it, many if you don't feel anything, what, what is the, because I know my nephew did that too. Like, what? Why take so many if it doesn't make you feel as much? As much as an elephant. Um, you cut, well, you go you go to where it's like normal. You know what I mean? Like, I don't feel sick. And if I took ten or twelve, I would still kind of not be there. You know what I mean? I just I'd be feeling not not good. No energy. I want you know sweating. You know, you know diarrhea. You know everything. Everything. You know you can't. You don't. Even, you're not going to do anything if you're withdrawn. You're just going to lay in bed and. <laughs> You be on your cell phone trying to get some more, you know. So but, you had to uh, take that many just to get past the withdrawal effects. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for heroin to come in or or, or something good, some oxy's or the bonds to smoke or something. I'm waiting for anything. But methadone is just the last thing on the table. That's like, all right, well, I'll take this so I don't get sick. So okay. to me, I was I, I wasn't afraid of it. You know what I mean? And you weren't um, even trying to get off at that time. You were just waiting to find the next. Dope. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. Yeah. As retarded as that sounds, yeah. All right. So, um, I uh, go into the kitchen, and like I said, I had this beef with my wife or whatever, and I opened up the cupboard, and this, and this dude had gotten me a bottle of Everclear, and um, I had never had it. It was like 200% alcohol, straight alcohol, or 200 proof, right? So that's 100% alcohol. So anyways, I, had, I, I was going to pour a shot, and like later, I kind of realized, well, those were all double shots, dude. So I really took like, you know, six double shots. That's like a lot. Well, anyway, so I put a shot. I took it. Started watching some TV. Came back in, took another shot. And, you know, um, doing whatever. Took another shot. I th I'm thinking I took maybe like six, five or six or seven of these double shots, right? Of Everclear. And then, and then like one, at, at some point, I feel I'm feeling not good. So I was feeling great, but then all of a sudden it's like, I'm not feeling good. And I'm in this kind of fear starts coming over me that I've something's not right. So it's not only do I not feel good, but I'm scared of what's going to happen. I don't know. I was just like, I didn't realize it, but my discernment already started like going into the spirit. So had you I got ever, up real quick. Had you ever had with all the drugs you'd done, all the alcohol mixing, whatever your whole life. Had you ever been like close to death before or experienced like a really bad overdose? You'd never, this was like, no. Uh, well, one, t one time I was in a hotel in, uh, in Oakland, California, and I had bought some fentanyl and I squeezed out all the gel on the top of the TV at the hotel. And I made a really short straw and I was like, <laughs> and I took it up my nose, all the gel out of the, out of those patches are supposed to kind of like release over time. But I took it all at once, and then I wake up on the ground, and there's some dude that I don't know, some stranger, and he's saying, he's over me, commanding, he's saying, live and not die, he's saying things like that. And I'm just kind of coming to, or whatever, and there's a stranger over me, praying over me. So In your hotel room? In my hotel room, yeah, I was by myself. So then, like, I basically, when I get up, and I kind of, like, get my wits about me, he's gone. And I go outside. There's nobody outside. I don't have any. I still to this day. I don't know. Oh, but that was angel. So that was just an angel that looked like a man. I guess. Boy, they look just like a person. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've I, had entertained angels <laughs> that look just like people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I wouldn't know. It's just like he disappeared. I don't know how he got in the hotel room with the door the way it was locked. I mean, I'm in there doing drugs. I'm not like got the door open. No, that so. was an angel. That was an angel. 
Yeah, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, thinking that was an angel or what? Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. But that was the closest I had ever come to where I had done too much. You know what I mean? Like, I pretty much am like an elephant when it comes to my liver. And I could, I could, like, even right now, I could probably do like something that would kill everybody. And I'd be like, well, I don't even feel it. You know, just, it's just, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just how it is. I don't know why. I'm only 180 pounds. So, um, yeah, well, anyways, uh, I took those double shots. Go, my, I end up, I'm not feeling good. I end up going to my bedroom. When I walk in my bedroom, now I can tell. I get, I get all this information just floods my mind. So I walk in my bedroom, and somehow I know that I'm not alone. Okay? I know that there is – I know – not only do I know that someone's there, I don't see nothing. But not only do I know that I'm not alone, I know who – I know it's the death angel. I'm thinking – Right now, I'm thinking it might be the death angel that when they put the blood on the doorposts and he killed all the firstborn. It might have been that guy. I don't know. I never saw nothing. But, like, I, all, I immediately know that there is an entity here, and his job is to take me somewhere. I know that. And I know that I'm dying and I'm dead or something. Like, I, I rock in my bedroom, dude, and all the information, I already have it. So, immediately, so I stopped walking. I grabbed all of my entertainment center, and as I'm looking around on the floor... I my vision is doing something that I it's weird and like I'm like oh no oh no and then I realized oh I wasn't supposed to be drinking with freaking methadone dude I just took 15 of those and I'm just like what did I do I'm like I'm so stupid man it's just so regular I didn't even think about the methadone you know and so anyways I so I, I quickly start repenting and it was not heartfelt I was numb I just Jesus I just say it Jesus Please forgive me. I'm not, I know I'm not, shouldn't have done this. I know, you know, I'm going to die. Please forgive me. I'm screwed. I, it's over. I'm screwed. Hell, like that. You know, it wasn't, and I don't even get through the prayer. So it's not heartfelt. And I don't even get through that much of a prayer. That was too long. I really like was starting it to where in the middle of like, like maybe right after I said, Jesus, please forgive me. And then I continue. I'm already getting taken like something uh, that, that death angel thing, it, it grabbed me. And it somehow grabbed me like in my bones. Like I picture him got a hold of my spine because I he glued, he welded himself to me. It was like there was no fight, and it was humongous, strong thing, right? So immediately I'm I'm just starting to pray this repentance, and I just start flying through a tunnel, and this thing's taking me at the speed of light. Never been. I, I've ridden crotch rockets and had some Camaro Super Sport. I've never flown that fast and anything. I mean, a plane don't feel fast. But it's like, uh, as I'm going by, there's people on each side, you know, and they're screaming out, let me out, I'm a Christian. And then I kind of discern, oh, okay, I can pick up on their thoughts and stuff, you know what I mean? I can hear everything they're saying. I can feel what every individual was feeling, even though I'm flying by them and they're already, you know, 10 miles behind me. I had no problem in that split second. I had no problem downloading all of them. Like, I'm like, dude, it was crazy being in the spirit. Like, all truth is opened up to you, you know what I mean? And so, like, I, so that the first section was basically people who say, yeah, Jesus is my savior. He's my Lord, but he's not your Lord. And you don't even know him. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, the Jesus you serve is not God. Is not the Jesus in the Bible. Jesus in the Bible has problems with all these things. Jesus you serve is like, he's, he's like new age, <laughs> you know, whatever. So there's a section for those dudes. You know, that was the first section I went through. And it's like, going th I'm going down a dirt tunnel going straight down in the center of the earth. And I don't know where this tunnel exists, but it, I was in Fountain, Colorado. Somehow or another, I'm in a tunnel. I don't know where the heck, but yeah, so. Wait, so this first group you pass is, is people who worship a false Jesus. Or it's like, you know, hey, let's say I run into a guy at the gas station. I'm like, are you a Christian? And he's like, yeah, I'm a Christian. It doesn't mean that he's a Christian. There's a bunch of those guys down there that the Luke, they're in. The lukewarm. Lukewarm. Who, get, who Christ, God says, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm going down. I'm flying down a throat of dirt, you know. <laughs> I don't know. So, I mean, so anyway, they're, they're asking. They weren't looking at me as the thing. They were, they were looking over me. I know they were talking to the death angel thing. And they were screaming out, I'm a Christian. I'm a real Christian. Like, that was, if they could convince him that that was true, it was like they believe he's going to grab them and take them back to he take them either to their body or to heaven. I don't know. But they're going to get out. Like, that was the key to getting out. 
I know Jesus is the key to getting out. So that was the that was the general kind of truth. Okay. And the second section. So then we come to this big this big section. This looks like I'm in the Kingdom up in Seattle or the Safeco Field or something. Like, but way bigger than that, and it's underground. So humongous, like cave. I don't know. But anyways, I see all these people. I'm not trying to uh, spend much time on those first two sections, like you said. So uh, the second section was sexual perversion. It was it was people who that was their God. You know what I mean? They, they, it, when it came before what I want sexually in Jesus, they took this instead. They, Jesus went out the window on that one sin. And so that one sin was their God. And that's the section they're in. And they're and they're like. They're, they're doing these these heinous, perverted, sick things in their mind. It says in the Bible, you'll be given over to your sin, but nobody's enjoying it. There's no, they're, they're, just like me, I, all truth was known to me. It's just kind of like you get the mind of God, kind of like whatever God thinks is right, you're going to think is right because now you're not deceived. You know what I mean? And so you kind of, when, when, when you go in the spirit world, rather you go to heaven or hell, you really come into agreement with God's thinking because now there isn't any of this bull crap that tricked you into thinking that was fine. So they're over they're in their mind. They're over and over. They're like doing perverted stuff that they shouldn't be doing, but they're just totally, it's a torment. They're like, ah! like they want it to stop. Like they view it as wrong, how it should be viewed at that point. And there's no enjoyment. So they can't stop doing it. And it's just it's from the day they died until who knows when, you know what I mean? And it's, it's like, so then, but then I get taken from that, the sexual perversion place. I start approaching what looks like a giant castle. This is where Joseph Smith comes in. So it's, it's the, when I look at the castle, it looks like it's dope, dude. Like something off freaking Robin Hood or King Arthur's court. I don't know. It's like, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's Hollywood, man. It looks like um, billions and billions of dollars freaking castle. Like, it's sick. And so, and I'm approaching it and the doors are closed and it's got wooden doors and they're round at the top, right? Or it's a round, one round thing, but they open, right? And they have the, the uh, it's a, they put a ring in a bull's nose, dude. And it's like, those, that's what was on the, um, on the, on the door handles, for the door handles, right? So as we're coming up to the castle, I start to, the, the doors start to open and somehow I get this information and this continues. I always will just get information out of nowhere while, while I was, while I was in spirit and the information that came was basically, I looked at the castle different. It was like, Oh, this isn't just a castle. This is a place that they wanted. It is a place for, if you wanted to be God on earth and you wanted to have everybody follow you and serve you, you wanted to be king of the world. And this, this would be, this would be perfect. This is, this is like the house you'd want to be, a castle you'd want, right? So, like but, uh, so the, castle? <laughs> like but there was a lot of, maybe this castle? It was more spread out. It was like more flat faced and maybe taller in the middle. Uh, it had a lot of white, like marble or something. Do you know what building this is? I have no idea. Th this is the Salt Lake City Mormon uh, Temple. Oh, I thought that was a freaking castle, dude, from, like, England. All yeah, right, so let's, right. let's pause for one sec, because <clears throat> I just want to yeah. talk about the castle for a minute. Because um, each point where you hit something that's, like, a tangible symbol, I, wa I want to talk about that for a minute. So the, here's just a bunch of different types of castles and buildings. And what, what played out for me in that when you're talking about, you know, Joseph Smith, who you found inside of this castle, um, to relate it to Mormonism, um, you know, in ancient times, you know, this could be kind of like a castle, these little buildings over here. Some of these are just examples. But this one specifically, like this one and this one, these are painted images of a dream from the Book of Mormon called Lehi's Dream. Okay. And, um, Nephi, who was the main prophet in the Book of Mormon, um, his father's name was Lehi, and this is supposed to be the Tree of Life, and this is the great and spacious building that was off to the side, and there was this big ditch between it, you know, and he, he has this whole vision um, that he shares, okay, so, so, um, this is the vision, too, these are just different artists, uh, 
trying to depict what this looked like. And as you're talking about this castle, it reminded me of this. So this is the sit where the symbolism comes in for like Mormonism, because this great and spacious building that is outlined that would be like an ancient castle in those days. Um, they call, well, let me tell you what the Book of Mormon says about it. It's Wait, I saw, you mean I saw a church? That wasn't a castle, it was a church. Well, is that, what mean, is that what you're thinking? Because, yeah, everybody that was in there was religious leaders. They led people to hell. That was, well, yeah, look at the you, Mormon temple. I mean, what is, what does this temple look like? <laughs> Wicked. A castle, a, a wicked castle, right? For real, yeah. Um, and so it, it says, and the large and spacious, in, this is First Nephi twelve eighteen. this is from the Book of Mormon. It says, and the large and spacious oh, building which thy father saw is vain imaginations. Okay, that would be what these people in there have, these vain imaginations that they could be bigger, as great as God. And the pride of the children of men. Okay, these are prideful men who think they you know, need to be seen. And during his vision of the things which his father saw, an angel taught Nephi that the great and spacious building represented the vain imaginations of the pride of the children of men. Joseph was imprisoned, Word. okay, in the nightmare of his own Book of Mormon prophecy. So this is what I want to point out is that a lot of these things that you're saying, this is where the Book of Mormon gets trippy. It actually becomes like trippy because, um, and, and we'll go into this more later when you get into the hierog hieroglyphs part. But I just I just want to keep touching on different parts of it and bringing them in so we can pull the whole picture together. Because um, to create understanding from the get-go, um, the Book of Mormon is tricky because it does have truth. And it, it does twist things and it presents them in such a way that it's like it's true, but it's mirrored back at the Mormon church. And so... So it talks about these vain, like when, when it's prophesying in the Book of Mormon, things that are evil out in the world, you know, and people are going, oh, yeah, this is true, who are within the Mormon church. What they don't realize is that the Book of Mormon is actually talking about the Mormon church when it's talking about these wicked Gentiles. Um, and so <laughs> anything, <laughs> it, it tells on them. God's really clever, you know, because the Book of Mormon is really clever the way... Um, and we'll get into it more later when we get to this part with the hieroglyphs and all of that stuff. But, but this is just really interesting because um, this castle that you're talking about that they go into really yeah. reminded me of this building in Lehi's dream of, of the vain imaginations in these people in this one, you can see, oh, can you see all these people up here who yeah. are mining the building and they were taunting and making fun of all these people who are actually walking to the tree of life which is Jesus Christ. And, and so, I mean, Mormonism is an antichrist religion and I'll talk more about that as, as we keep going. But so anyways, I just, wow. I just wanted to point that out. Um, I said, it shows that we truly are using our agency and really thinking for ourselves, the people in the great and spacious building are always referred to as a nameless crowd or a faceless mob, which reminds me of the group later that you get into, um, which we'll go into later. So, so there's, yeah, this big building, which reminds me of this Mormon temple. And so then um, what happens when you go inside? So, yeah, the, so the doors open and it's like really brilliantly bright. Okay. But, but once you pass that, you're just going down a, a hallway with st stone, like pavement or whatever, or uh, what do you call it? A walkway. Okay. And there's just jail cells on both sides. It just kind of like your poem. There were open doors too, and none of the jails were closed. So as yeah, I'm and going said, through, and you said when you walked up, I, I put these in here because you said when you walked up to the temple or to the castle, it seems like it's going to be real beautiful inside, like you're walking into Oz, you know, or something like, oh my god, yeah. But really, oh, for when, sure. when you get in there, what you find is just this man behind the curtain, and it's an illusion, right? And what what's it, really inside of there? It was an illusion for sure. Yeah, um, I'm just I'm still tripping out. Well, you tell me that was that might have been a church I saw because that makes a lot of sense. I always thought it was a castle. But anyways, um, so I go in there and like I already know this is a section, all the false religion. Like if if you if you wanted to be God, you wanted to be like God and you wanted people to follow you, if you were able to pull that off in your lifetime, so then now you're in that in that authority position. Okay. And then you use that 
to freaking BS a bunch of people with some stupid crap so that you can make yourself look better or whatever, right? So it just basically, all these people are following you and then where you lead them is to hell with you. You get your own section. It's like, okay, you know, that's what you want. You know, you want to be big, big bad guys, here's your castle. You know, and you walk into it, you retard, it's a bunch of jail cells. You know, it's like, and so you go. Jo- Joseph Smith actually taught about a place, spirit prison. And I can't remember if it's in the Bible because what? he taught about a place called spirit prison. <laughs> and isn't it funny that that's where you saw him? Oh, that's crazy. I mean, okay, so there's many people in these jail cells. It's not just Joseph Smith. This is a common thing throughout the era, right? right. So in my peripherals, I, I think I, I did look over and I'm, and I'm seeing something that it reminds me of... I don't know if uh, like Beverly Hills Ninja dude where there's like those monks in those orange outfits. So there's somebody in like an outfit like that monk outfit is the like on the first jail cell to my left, right? And I just kind of see it in my peripherals and we keep going. So I'm already past him. So, but it's like there's many people in, in these in these jail cells. One of them look reminded me of the Lord of the Rings that wizard dude. One of them kind of looked like that. I don't know. But anyways, there, there's a bunch of them. So we're going down this long hallway. There's your jail cells. And it's everybody from the very beginning of, of, of the planet, you know what I mean, that has done this type of Joseph Smith thing, right? So, so you know what I mean? You're talking about Muhammad. You're talking about Buddha. You're talking about, I don't know. You know what I mean? But I didn't. Yeah, but like, so, so, but I don't see those guys. I'm just assuming that if I would have looked around and, you know, if I'd have known what to look for or what they look like, I might have recognized them. But anyway, so, but at one point, um, as I'm going and we're getting towards the end, I'm starting to look around more. And it's like, it's like, uh, somehow or another, I know that the next section is my section. So I'm really trying not to go there anyway. But it's like, I, I, I look, I look around and, and a guy that I see, is somehow when I look at him, he's a white dude. He reminds me of Abraham Lincoln. He's 1800s. He's a false prophet. Okay. Um, really powerful or whatever. And I know it's America. I just somehow or another, I just know all those four things. That's all I know. But as I'm looking at him, I'm looking at his clothes and I like those clothes. 1800. I like, it kind of trips me out how they used to dress. Right. Um, but I wouldn't ever dress like that, but I'm just saying like, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> you see Let me see. No, not like that. That's like army or something. No, well, that was that was. Like, yeah, yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about. You're, I mean, he's got a pocket watch. You know who wears a pocket watch? You know, it, you know this is like back in the day, right? So, it, so pa- it, pause real quick. Let's talk for a second because you you said that what who you saw in there he reminded you of Abraham Lincoln, right? Just the fact that they're from the same timing, maybe, yeah. or they were, or, or I'm just. Something. So I don't know why, but that, that's just, that's just the thing, what I'm getting. I don't know why. Well, so, so let me tell you what stood out to me when you said that, because that was a key for me too. Because um, a lot of Mormon Freemasons and a lot of Freemasons and a lot of just American patriots, which I'm not any of the such, um, really. I'm a, pa- I'm a patriot. Of, kind of worship, you know these these founding fathers or whatever um but if you look deeply into it there's a lot of falsities and all of that as well and these pictures of of lincoln i had them saved in my phone from quite a while ago under a folder that i call um nephilim slash giants because uh, oh he's because he said because the the niagara falls uh well look at him i mean he i was looking at I've he's studied tall. a lot about about the Nephilim, and and he's very creepy looking when you really get into his pictures. Um, like, look how much taller he is than these other guys, and and he wears that top hat to make him seem even taller, like as if. Or maybe, hey, maybe he had a cone head like the like the Egyptian skulls they find in Peru or whatever. Well, you got these ones where he doesn't have his hat on. You know, that's oh, okay. I right, scratched that idea, but. <laughs> The people used to say that, but, you know, it, who knows? Uh, but so one thing I, I want to kind of go into for a minute, why I pulled this part out of you mentioning that. And you're like, I don't know why I said that, but just that time period. Well, I felt like I knew why you said that, because to me, it made sense because it brings in the Nephilim piece. Um, 
because I've done a lot of study oh, and okay. research on the Nephilim from the Bible. Did you mention that in one of your other interviews later it, it, about the angel, the tall angel reminding you of Nephilim? Just like an evil spirit that, that is that big makes me think Book of Enoch stuff. Yeah. Just make, just make, I don't know what I'm talking about, but as, the, as I guess, those are the things I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the reason this stood out to me is because in, in a lot of my research on the giants I, and um, the Nephilim and reading all of the different biblical sources of the Nephilim, I, and notice too, these two guys right here are, they have their hands in their coat like this. That's a Freemason symbol right here. That's what they're doing, paying homage to Freemasonry with their hand in their jacket. Door. So the Nephilim, um, uh, so this, okay, this is an important piece that we need to expound on because in Mormonism, this is something that God has been revealing to me. And I mm. had, um, well, where should I start? So my daughter had, my kids have dreams and spiritual gifts and, and I'm- can you, pop your pic can you pop your picture up a little bit bigger? I can't see you at all. You're My small. picture? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can't see me at all? I, I'm not clearly like that big. You know? Oh, yeah. When I screen share, we get small. Um, okay. So, okay. So, this part where my daughter had a dream about Nephi. And Nephi, uh, have you even heard the name Nephi? Have you ever heard of Nephi? Mm -hmm. So, he's the main prophet in the Book of Mormon. And the Mormon church, everybody knows who Nephi is because he's like, almost worshipped the, the golden angel no that's moroni and then you you've got joseph smith at the top and you got moroni and then you got nephi oh, okay. moroni was the one that brought him the gold plates supposedly that tra that tr he translated the book of mormon from that's on the top of all the temples and and nephi is the prophet in the book of mormon of the time period from which the book of mormon was written about where supposedly jesus christ came to these people who were the nephites that it, the the main tribes in the book of mormon were the nephites and the lamanites um uh, this is interesting okay so you said nephi is a prophet now a prophet it says in the bible it says that they have to what they say has to come true every time if they ever prophesy and it does not happen they're put to death so anyways nephi has a prophecy that he spoke and then later it happened that way is that what you're telling me or you're saying they just call him a prophet but for real he's never done prophet stuff well in the, book, in the book he was in the book he was a prophet and in the book of mormon he was prophesying and things were coming to pass it this is during an ancient but not in, not in real life that's what's hard to say. I, I don't I don't know if the Book of Mormon well, is now a true time period. It, it was ancient time period. With with the Bible, okay, this is what I'm getting. So it's like with the Bible, if you want to take it and you say, Oh, it's been changed, go look at the actual tablets that they found in the cave. You know what I mean? The uh I forgot what they're called, but um in the in the clay jars that the kid threw the rocks, right? And he found he found basically the Bible all written down on, you know, some of it yeah. was sheepskin or whatever. I don't know what they used, but make a long story short. So like, if you take the Bible and you say, did someone make this up yesterday? And I go, no, come look at, and then I got, I got the, the originals, you know, and if I knew Greek and Hebrew and you match them up, it says exactly what the Bible is. Isaiah, Isaiah, it's the same. This one's old. This one's new. We didn't just write it yesterday. Like, so is you, are you able to like say, here's the Book of Mormon. Here's the ancient prophecies. Oh, here's the tablets from 10,000 years ago that we actually have. Is there any physical evidence or it's all just bull crap? Well, that's Which what that's that's one of the big discussions and arguments is that he supposedly did did have the golden plates which were what he supposedly translated from the golden plates that the angel of moroni took him to the hill Cumorah, that he dug them up brought them back hid them and used a seer stone to translate these hieroglyphs from this golden plates to the book of mormon that's supposedly where the book of mormon came from he says so, that the hieroglyphs yeah I saw hieroglyphs up in the air. I know. We're going to get into that. Totally. And so, oh, okay. so, so, but Nephi being the main prophet in the Book of Mormon, he is um, something. So this is another one of where God gets clever. Okay. Because in the Book of Mormon, 
his name is Nephi. And do, do you know what the Nephilim are? Yeah, for sure. I know what the Nephilim are. So they are the an, an, Genesis 6 says angels came down and then they lusted after women. So they start sleeping with them, making babies. And then the babies come out and these are like giants and powerful, strong, and they're like cannibals and wicked. And then they flood and then God is like, screw it. I'm flooding everything. And Noah was the only, Noah and his family, I guess, or Noah is the only one pure in his bloodline at the time of the flood. So it went through everybody. So then it, it says in the Bible also that, that there were giants in those days and after, right? It says yeah, somehow, somehow, after. somehow they, somehow they are after. I don't know how it works. So yeah, this I, is, I know that scripture. Yeah, yeah. So this is where God gave me vision, and like I woke up one morning oh. in a vision and a download, and it was so much and so deep and so scientific and like more than I could retain that all I could write was a list of traits that God had had shown me and been imparting to me um, of the traits of the current day Nephilim hybrid, right? There, that we still okay. have hybrids here. And how they are not giants anymore was what he showed me is they have been breeding. So, so the Illuminati um, has a breeding program and they, they breed children for these elite bloodlines and what they've been doing is breeding these giants with little people for generations to get them to downsize that would work okay and it's really odd because they take a big and a small and put them together to get a medium right and then you mm. have a variation of all different kinds of weird traits that this ends up with and they're obsessed with like you said they're per they're perverse um they're often homosexual they're obsessed with incest because they think they're so wonderful because they are God, you know, these Nephilim, they wanted to be like God, which is why they came down and laid with men and they lusted after women and had these giant children. And they were seen as the gods anciently, you know, those were the gods who were worshipped um, when you polygods. And then, um, so what happened is instead of ending up, well, that God flooded the whole earth because of them, right? And so we, we have authority of the earth. God gave us dominion as Adam's seed to have dominion of the earth. So if we knew that these giants were still here, these Nephilim hybrids, that then we would warfare against them, right? Spiritual warfare or, or come before the throne of God or, you know, so that they know that they're not supposed to be here, that they're not legal, right? Because they come from fallen angels and these rituals are still being done to call on the fallen angels that's what these sexual ritual abuse um rituals that are done all over in these churches i know especially in the mormon church that breed seed of the fallen with um man they're still doing the same things but they're down right, well, them. okay so that sounds crazy i did not figure you said uh <laughs> however the, the scripture that's coming to me is jesus says and the days of Noah also will be when I come back. And when he comes back, it's going to be pretty soon. So you're talking about like around now. Yeah. So the days of, and the days of Noah, the book of Noah, this is, or whatever you call it, this is a small book. You know what I mean? Like it goes, it got like two pages. You got only two things that happen that you even care about. Uh, giants, flood. And he says already, I promise not to do the flood ever again. But he says, this is going to happen again. You know what I mean? He says in the days by of fire, by fire and the sword so, next time, and just not by flood. Yeah, he should. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. I'm just saying for anybody who thinks this is cuckoo, uh, giants, Nephilim, or whatever, you're wrong. Number one, you know I can only explain it to you. I can't understand it for you. It's like this is the, Jesus said that in the days you know will be when he comes back. So if there was DNA twisting with angels and making weird stuff, chimeras or whatever, I don't know, but DNA science stuff right if that was happening before the flood that's what's gonna be happening when jesus comes back you know you can exactly. bet you know bingo and so, so that, i mean if, it, if it lines up with the bible if it lines up with the bible we're done talking about it like, that's, that's exactly what it that's what he was showing me is how in today what you just said about and 
um, there were giants in that day and after and in the coming of the son of man that it would be as it was in the days of Noah, meaning that there will be all of these messed up hybrids to the point that were so corrupt that God was going to come and destroy them all again, just like he did in the flood. That's exactly what he means when he says that. So this is what he's showing me is that. All of these people he showed me by name, by picture, by image, by trait, by, um, you know, jawline, by eye. They have huge eyes. They have long jaws because, and if you go look up the traits of incest, and this is all in my, in my spiritual warfare handbook, I have a list of the traits of the hybrid Nephilim of today. Um, you know, I grew up with people in my ward who had little tiny short arms, you know, and a, a lot of the red hair comes from incest and the really big eyes like angel eyes, you know, um, these are these are traits that they carry. So what he was showing me and why he showed me that and my daughter's Weird. dream that she had, I look over at this notebook and the, and the name Nephi is written on the notebook and it hits me. I'm looking at the word that the word Nephilim the word Nephi, the name Nephi, is the first several words of the word Nephilim. The name Nephi is the first Ugh. several letters of the word Nephilim. So then what Holy Spirit drops into my soul is that the Mormon church was started by and is run by an elite bloodline of Nephilim hybrid. Ugh. Holy smokes. Okay, so so this is this is why I, I I was like Lincoln to me stood out as those traits in his face, his long face, his long uh he had I wonder. Traits. So our I wonder. Four, the forefathers of our country that run this world and the heads of these churches, they all come from the same bloodlines. And this this is what God's showing me is how, how it's all linked in, right? So so that's why I'm like, okay, I got to show these pictures because it was interesting that you chose his name because he also reminds me a lot of Joseph Smith in some ways, um, even though he didn't necessarily remind you of him in look. Me, he d he does in a way when it comes to his characteristics and certain things about oh, that's him. It. That's interesting. So I want to make it really clear that in this video with um, Cody, that Cody is not trying to say that when he had this experience in some of his other videos, um, he expresses how his father-in-law brought him essentially all of these Mormon things that he was not associated with set up in an email or like a presentation of pictures of history of Mormonism. And so people have challenged Cody to say, well, you can't have known what Joseph Smith looked like because there's no real actual photographs of Joseph Smith. So at one point in this interview, you will see me pulling up several different photos of Joseph Smith that all look very different. One of them supposed to be possibly a real photograph of him. It's not clear or certain. But I need to clarify for and in behalf of Cody that those who have challenged him on this, he has made it clear in other interviews, but it doesn't seem to be clear to the listeners, that he is not saying that he recognized Joseph based on a picture of him, of his physical feature, features. What Cody's trying to express, and he has said this, is something was playing out in his spirit through the Holy Spirit, revealing to him that these pictures that are representative of Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet who started the, the false religion, Mormonism, this prophet Joseph Smith is who was being represented in these pictures. And so therefore, his spirit was recognizing that what he saw in, the, in hell, in this space, in the spirit, when he died was the same place and was associated with the person that was represented in these, whether they were paintings, drawings, um, whether there was a real photograph. I don't know what picture his, his father-in-law showed him at the time, but it doesn't matter because that wasn't the identifying factor. The identifying factor was the revelation that Holy Spirit was giving to him at the time that this was in fact Joseph Smith that he saw in hell when the different factors were presented to him by his father-in-law at the time. So I hope that clears up any misconceptions that Cody recognized him by the way that he looked. It wasn't a, a, a physical feature look thing. It was a spiritual revelation through Holy Spirit that took place. I didn't think you were going to say nothing about no Abraham Lincoln having anything to do with nothing. So <laughs> you, you pulled the rabbit out of the hat, you know? Out of a big, tall hat. A big, tall, tall big, hat. Tall hat. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, you no. saw, so then you see it reminds you of that time period, and you see him over in the corner, and what happens? Yeah. Next? So he's in the corner of a jail cell, and there's no door on it, so he could walk out, but he's not. And basically, like when you look at him, he's looking away from me, but like he's got like his eyes closed and he's mumbling. Basically, you can tell that he's like in a vivid dream. But you know, what I mean, that's what I'm trying to. That's what I related to. So, anyways. When, when my attention went on him, I focused a little bit too much. I kept, you know, because first of all, I'm like, dude, who's that? You know, oh, look at those clothes. Oh, I've never seen anybody from 1800s. And then because he's a white American, all those things are like, well, I'm a white American. Let's look at this dude, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't know why, but that's where I focused on him maybe too much. I don't know. But as we're going past and I'm, and I'm kind of like breaking my neck, you know, I end up like just somehow shooting into his head. So I just go like right into his head. Just like a cartoon, right? So all of a sudden I'm all of a sudden I'm standing on the grass out on a sunny day. And we got wind, we got birds chirping. Um this is this is real it's you can't tell no difference. This is very real. So it's it's very convincing, right? So only I knew that I had just been outside in that castle hallway only i knew that you know what i mean so uh anyways i'm standing on the grass and i look over first thing i do is like i can tell there's somebody in my peripherals i look over and the dude is looking down at his foot on the grass and he's moving it back and forth and he's he's kind of has deja vu and he thinks this is suspect there's something off that he can pick up on right so he's i don't know it's like almost like he just wants to see if the grass is real you know, or whatever, right? And I and I didn't at the moment. I didn't know why he was questioning if it was real. Cause I mean, it looks real to me, right? So all of a sudden, I'm like, not in hell no more. I'm on a yard, somebody's yard. I look, and so then he looks up, and I go, I look to what he's looking at, and I look over, and there's this this plain plain two story house. You know what I mean? It kind of reminded me of a barn because you know houses today kind of they do a lot of things with the you know, with the, with the buildings or whatever. And this was just real plain square kind of or whatever. And, you know, two stories. And so anyways, as I'm, as I look at it, I hear his thoughts. And from that moment on, I'm going to, I'm going to get to know this guy better than his mother, because every thought he has, I'm going to, it's going to go into my thought, every feeling he has, I'm going to feel it. it we're connect, We're fully connected. So all of a sudden I realize I, I hear his thoughts. Like he's thinking I'm home. Okay, so now I realize, oh, looks like this is this dude's house, you know, like, so I'm trying to follow the story, right? So then, so then it's like he starts taking off towards his house. He doesn't like acknowledge me, so I don't know if I'm invisible or what, but he starts kind of speed walking towards his house. I look at the house and then I hear like a ruckus or some noise or something, commotion going on in the top story. I can, I can almost zoom in my hearing. It was weird. So then I'm like, okay, what is, you know, so then I wondered. And now from this moment on, anything I wonder, I get the answer to it. So, so like, Cody, it just, it, that house that you're at, did it look like any of these houses? Yeah, it looked a lot like that one. It's not like the colors on the windows, it's more plain. No, it was two story. It wasn't that one. I, I mean, maybe in the back of it had that. This one, this one is white and had a hotel on the back of it, but it's an old one that's black and white. But this, this is, um, this is the house that he lived in with his family. The, the Joseph Smith Mansion in Nauvoo, Illinois, is a building constructed by Joseph. That Smith. one up there. Hold yeah. on, go up a little bit. I'll go to that one up there. I Do want to say it was wider. That looks like a thin two. I mean, maybe it was, I don't know. Maybe that's there's, a, there's a bunch of pictures. I mean, fits. Okay, so like I'm picture. This is what I'm picturing when I when I go back and I and I visualize it. Talking about almost perfectly square, plain. So I'm not seeing no painted shutters or anything. Yeah, I'm well, they've, see, I'm they've seeing done a lot like, of that since back in those times. You would have seen it in its original state. They keep these updated because people go and tour these, so they've probably made this a lot nicer than it used. I don't to think I've seen. I never saw that side view. I don't think is. What, I was looking directly on it when I was looking at it. See this one. So, this none, 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 none of those are an exact match, but right. I mean, dang, that one's super close. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so, so take, look, take those so shutters off one, in the cool window. This one and this one. Hold on. 
this one right here, these those are the same house. This one. Oh yeah, they look totally different. Yeah, so this this one's really old before they tore the hotel down because like it says up here, um, Smith used this house as a personal home, a public boarding house, a hotel, and a site for the performance of temple ordinances. So th this wherever we were wherever we were at, I know now it wasn't a real place. You know what I mean? Like it was in his head, right? But wherever we're looking at was white. It was he a white was square home. house. His image of home. He yeah, he's he he's having he's just thinking like you and me do, like, oh cool, I'm at work. I don't know, like that's where I'm at. It's it's just kinda like he's not trying to tell me that. He just he just kinda recognizes it, but I am I'm linked up to his thoughts and everything. He can't do nothing without me seeing it, basically, from that point on. So anyways, uh I hear this commote. That's crazy that picture is I'm right now I'm just like, you know, getting chills. I'm like, yeah, probably the dang house, you know. Um, so it's like, uh, I hear a commotion in the top story. Okay. I'm out on the grass and I wonder what it is. And the moment that I was stupid enough to wonder, I get picked up and I get like flying with flying, but I felt like I was dangling, you know what I mean? So I wasn't like Superman, but like getting taken towards the top story of this house, the wall of it. Okay. And so immediately I go blind. And then I go deaf, and it seemed like the longest moment. Like when I went blind and I went deaf, I thought I went back to hell in a place in hell. Like I thought that, you know, it was all bad right now, you know, but then all of a sudden I could see and I could hear and I'm in the, I'm in the top story of this house, the like antique and stuff or whatever around me. I, but, um, but I immediately, I'm not, I, I don't really look around the room because right in front of me is two fat alligator face looking demons they were they're like snail body like hunchback in order dame times 10 right like they look all deformed dude but it's like uh you know they, they look like a ball almost with like this alligator face you know what i mean and that yellow eyes like really like when they looked at you it was like they were i don't know you didn't feel comfortable because it's one of, so one of them as soon as i come through the wall like one of them like looks at me and now I'm just like looking eye to eye with him or whatever. Oh, you saw pictures? Yeah. Hey, yeah, but and so it'd be like that eye only way more yellow. You know what I mean? What are you are you finding it? Yeah, it's check it out. It kinda has a hunchback. Yeah, these are hey. new pictures that I I mean you can't it's hard to find a snail looking alligator demon online, but these are just a few you know, you got a hunchback there, you got I was wondering like that picture go up. Okay, so I was wondering, this whole time I've wondered why it looks so exaggerated big back. Maybe not only did they have a hunchback problem, but, but maybe they were also, like, standing in that position, kind of, to make it look exaggerated. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that yeah. gargoyle or whatever? Mm-hmm, that, so, that slouch. Just, that I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah, like a wicked, disgusting slouch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, maybe, you know. I'm not going to go back and try to find out. It, maybe the fatter one on the left, that cartoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He kind of, the gargoyles from the Hunchback of Notre Dame or what those are. I mean, if I had to pick one of the three, it'd be the fattest one. But, but they're alligator. You said alligator snail. And so, so that just points to me to like reptilian, that a reptilian type um, demon. And, and yes, I just want It was definitely reptilian demon. And I want to point Definitely out that right in order for them to be in his house where he believed was home, what stands out to me there is that they would have had legal right to him. And what gives the demonic legal right to us is iniquity, iniquity on the bloodline. And for reptilian, the demonic reptilian to have access to you um, and be in your home, to me, that would point to joseph smith being reptilian seed of a reptilian bloodline um which uh, uh, i have felt and been feeling about him for some time I, and i do believe that the whole mormon church is run by elite reptilian nephilim hybrids from personal experience oh yeah I mean, I, I've heard people who've gone down under the tunnels and seen them shapeshift uh, and um, that they, 
J- just Joseph Smith's access to right. the angelic realms and, and the experience that you described for him to have that kind of interaction with an angel. Uh, yeah, he had to do a witchcraft or something. <laughs> oh, he was. We, yeah, he's on his Ouija board every night. Yeah, something I wonder. Like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I that's my my question about him is did he know um, how evil what he was into was? And I do believe so. I believe he was a big fat fraud and that he was part of an evil bloodline that was. Um, a big hoax that, that that that's what you know the churches are today is is the false religion that's put up by people who want the praise of men and so they create these and, and they're given information by the fallen the same way you know what happened when the fallen angels came down and interacted with the daughters of men and married them and created these seed they exchanged information that's how we got technology that you know they gave these daughters fathers these this technology and that's what dropped that's what i believe ai is you know what's behind ai and um and that's all of the ancient artifacts and pyramids and all of that you know the way that they're built that doesn't make any sense that that was all them you know and so so they've been exchanging information with man for praise you know for some time and it just all lines up with what you're going to go into with all of that so that's nuts that's crazy. I want to see a reptilian one day. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you a video of one who is shape shifting on video as she, she, she interviewed me. And I found out later she, she's totally, you can see her shape shifting in the video. She can't hold it. Based on a true story. Yeah. I'll she shape shifted while you were interviewing her? Not while she was interviewing me in another video she did, but it's on video. <laughs> Oh, yeah, send that one to me. I want to see that. I will. I will. Okay. Okay, so so you see these beings, and then what happens? Um, One of them looks at me, and then he speaks right into my head. This was very intentional, and that tripped me out. Okay, so he uses my voice in my thinking head to tell me to, base, to help him get that Joseph Smith dude upstairs up in the house right come in to, get him to come inside basically is what he tells me to do right and i think i don't say nothing i'm actually tripping out on the fact that he got access to inside my head like that but i do think like i do kind of like immediately make up my mind i'm not helping you and he received that and it's and it was just like lightning it was just like soon as i was just realizing what was going on he already knew i wasn't helping him and he looks away and he never looks at me again. And then I'm just standing there like, he just spoke to me in my head with my voice. So I okay, thought so that was crazy. That part, I also want to say that even in your experience of being taken to hell, you're still given the opportunity to help do wicked with these demonic who are calling on you and trying to, to um, you know, get you to come and help them round you up to try to do their dirty deeds. And even in hell, you still said no. That says something about about you, you know. It was just, I didn't think about it. It just was my reaction. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, it's, just, yeah. it's just another piece that stands out, but that, you know, that points to something. Okay. <laughs> it's crazy that I'm talking to you because you even know so much more about your stuff than I do. Even here I am down in hell and I'm still not going to obey your weird orders of help. No, no. Uh, forget about it. Uh, yeah. I want to hang out with these guys, right? So okay, so anyways. Now and then they go and... So then he looks away from me, right? And then those two are conversing and I can't, I cannot even uh, imitate it. Has that I almost said intimidate? Uh, I can't imitate it. It's like it's like uh, it's okay. So this one makes me reminds me of like a a uh, uh, an imposter. Uh, uh, darn it! False, a false, holy, a false speaking in tongue. False tongues. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it's a wicked language, and it sounded like s h i t. You know what I mean? And um, the talking. And, and somehow or another, although I, it's not English, so I don't know what they're saying. Somehow I know what they're saying, though. So I got both of those going parallel. So, like, as they're talking, I realize they're, they're frustrated because they want that dude to come inside. And they want help or whatever, right? So they're screeching out in this weird language, calling for help. Somehow I know that they're calling for help. But I didn't understand what they were saying 
necessarily. But then I look over to where like I'm, I'm imagining he, if you know, because he was already headed towards the house one way. I was off here to the left, and then I end up just bamming right through the front, through the wall or whatever at the top story. And so I'm kind of trying to guess where the front door would be or where, you know what I mean, where he would be at or whatever. Like, so I just kind of look, but I'm looking at a wall and carpet. I'm inside, right? But I look that way, and when I look that They are, they're mad at me because I just told on them because I said that the AI were the Nephilim, so they hung up on us. They said, oh yeah, no, you expose them. And you have some really good points. I'm super into like that stuff. I watch a lot of YouTube videos about that for long. You know, you know what I mean? All that stuff. So, plus, plus the hot fun is full of like, you got half force, half man. Okay, I'm gonna. It's cause, it's because we're talking on your phone, so I'm gonna hang up the phone. So this is interesting because this part is where Cody starts to go into when um, they call for help, which is when this fallen angel essentially comes in and appears and comes in in this form of being a black cube. So this is where we really start to have technical difficulties. This is where we start having dropouts. This is where we had to end up ending part one and we didn't get a good transition into the next part of the video. But I just wanted to come in and kind of clarify that this was where we started to go into the re revealing of the fallen in the Mormon church and the the revelation that Joseph Smith started to fall down and worship a fallen angel and that these reptilian demonic beings were calling for help and, and the thing that they called into help that came in as a black cube essentially uh, turns into a fallen angel. So this is where we transition into part two and this is where I just wanted to come in and confirm and and um, point out that this is where the enemy seems to be really upset that we're going in and exposing who this fallen angel is, which really points to Moroni, which really points to the symbolism um, around what happened with the revelation of Joseph Smith and his his. Uh, being given the golden plates through this angel Moroni and the fact that his experience seems to point to the fact that Moroni is a fallen angel and that he was worshiping angels and so excuse you know this sloppy end and the way it just fell out but we retained a little bit just to show what was going on here and 